Now we're going to talk about scouting, about a GM's perspective on this combine, and maybe take a trip down memory road with the guy that helped put together a championship team here in Indianapolis. And not just in Indianapolis, but in Buffalo and in Carolina as well. Yes, you remember here, we have plenty of Colts fans in the building, plenty of Colts jerseys on as well, that Bill Polian back in 1998 took that man out of the Tennessee, Peyton Manning holding up that number 18 jersey. Peyton would eventually win two Super Bowls. He'd shattered dozens of NFL records. It was more, though, than just Peyton Manning. How about Edron James? in the first round as well. How about Dwight Freeney with 122 and a half career sacks in counting? How about a guy like Bob Sanders or Dallas Clark or Reggie Wayne, our colleague at NFL Network? How about a career that has landed Bill Polian in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? He is a six-time NFL Executive of the Year. He is back home here in Indianapolis in front of these Colts fans, now taking time out of his busy ESPN schedule. Bill Polian, thank you so much, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to have you here. Great to be back in Indianapolis as well for another Combine. How important is the Combine for you as another step on the path to the draft? Well, it's, it's another step in a long process. It's an efficient step. One of the reasons we have the Combine and the reason it's named the Combine is because uh, when it first began, there were two scouting organizations called Combines because they were made up of combinations of teams. One was called Blesto, which stand, stood for Bears, Lions, Eagles, Steelers, Talent Organization. And the other was SIPO, Central Eastern Personnel Organization. And they held separate combines for the players, one in Seattle, one in Detroit. And after that went on for a couple of years, the powers that be got together and said, why don't we have just one? This is foolish trying to replicate this. And the college coaches didn't like the players bouncing around the country every weekend to workouts. So we created the Combine. That's why it's named what it is. It's a combination of all the teams who own it. And it's an opportunity for us, number one, to give physicals, standard physicals. And then we add to that the intelligence testing, the personality testing, the interviews with the clubs, the measurables, height, weight, speed, 40-yard dash, the various time drills, which all go into the, the process of determining where a player fits into the draft process. Is there something that is most important to you, Bill Polian, someone building his draft board? Well, the so-called measurables, height, weight, speed, are, are awfully important. Because you can't believe what that college told you. Oh, absolutely not. But beyond that, uh, there are guidelines that we use and metrics that we use Ours are uh, 25 years old that tell us that below a certain level, let's use receivers as an example, and this will vary from team to team, but, and, and offense to offense, but in our offense with Peyton Manning and the Colts in this building, a receiver who was slower than 4-5-1 had no chance of making it with us. It just wasn't going to because of what we asked him to do. And we had 25 years of experience that told us that. So if a guy was slower than that, we're going to say the odds of him being drafted are, by us are not great. Someone else might, but not for us. And so each team has their own standards, their own uh, metrics that they use, and they're awfully important. What's more important to you, combine results or when you turn on the tape whether or not a guy can play? Combine results tell you whether or not he qualifies. When you turn on the tape, now you find out where he qualifies. So, and there are always exceptions, obviously. But by and large, the numbers tell you whether he qualifies. And then the tape tells you where he fits in the pecking order. Take me through a Bill Polian combine interview. Tonight, all these teams are welcoming players into their hotel suites. They get 15 minutes, there's a horn out in the hallway, and they move to the next team. And then the next player moves in and sits down with you. What's that interview like? Well, for us, because we learned over time what we were good at and what we weren't good at. Don't forget, we, you know, our staff was together essentially almost 20 years, Carolina and then here. Um, we let our psychologists do the interviewing. 
because we found out over time that the players were so prepped up that they would come in and give us answers that were canned answers no matter what we asked. The agent said, prepare them. And we're not trained psychologists, so we couldn't respond in a way that would get to the heart of the matter. So unless we were going to put them on the chalkboard with uh, 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 X's and O's, if we weren't talking about personality, we let the psychologist do that. And she was very good at it. And what we would do would be to send the players a questionnaire in advance. They would fill it out. She would read it. She'd prepare questions that were unique to each player based on what the questionnaire showed, and she would interview. What was Peyton's interview like? Well, Peyton's interview was unique. Many Indianapolis uh, people probably have heard this story. You're given 15 minutes, and it used to be in the old days that you had to wrangle players, that you could not submit a list and have the players come there. You had to go out and wrangle players. So the scouts would go out and grab you and say, come on, you need to meet with the Colts, and we'll give you a Colts hat and a Colts jersey if you come. And each year, the, <laughs> the swag got better and better, you know. <laughs> Here's a watch, please. Come down the hall. Yeah, I had guys who would actually get in fist fights. <laughs> Wait a minute, he's coming with me. No, he's not, you know. <laughs> so finally, we, I was a member of the competition committee. We, we thought discretion was the better part of valor, and we said, okay, let's make this mandatory. So Peyton comes in. He's got his briefcase with him, and he takes out a pad, yellow legal pad, pencil, and we have the niceties. Hello, how are you? Nice to be here. And uh, he said, uh, would you mind if I ask you a few questions? And we said, no, not at all. Ask question one and question two, question three, question four, and finally, beep, the horn blows. He got up and he said, thanks a lot, guys. It's really been great. I really appreciate meeting you and talking to you, and I hope you draft me. See ya. Off he goes. We looked at each other and we said, he just interviewed us. <laughs> Had you made up your mind before he walked in the room? Oh, no, no, no. That was very early in the process. Ryan had missed his appointment with us, Ryan Leaf, and, uh, and, and Peyton kept his. And then uh, we went through a whole long process. We, I, when I got here, I queried the scouting staff. I said, how many people um, pick Ryan Leaf? 50%. How many picked Peyton Manning? 50%. I said, okay, there's no point in going any further. Let's get all the tape and look at all the tape. So we went back and got every pass Peyton threw at Tennessee. We got every pass Ryan threw at Washington State. We went through the tape. I sent it to Bill Walsh for him to look at. He was kind enough to help out. Um, obviously, all of us went through the whole process. And um, when we, it's along about the 15th or perhaps 20th of March, we went out to uh, work both guys out. And at that point, everybody now in the media has amnesia. Now, you're too young to be involved in that, but the people that were around have amnesia. Everybody says, oh, yeah, Peyton Manning was the guy. He wasn't the guy. Ryan Leaf was the guy. <laughs> and uh, and the, uh, the, the scuttlebutt was that Peyton had a weak arm, that he was a poor athlete, and that he was, quote, a product of the system, close quote. I, to this day, I don't know what that means. And uh, even though I often kid him about looking like Ichabod Crane when he ran, <laughs> he, he was a much better athlete than people saw. And he understood the offense completely that he played at Tennessee. Um, Ryan was, did not have as strong an arm. He wasn't as good an athlete. He wasn't as good a shape. And he wasn't nearly as prepared to come into the NFL and bear the burdens of being a starting quarterback. And we were going to start the rookie. We said, let, let him go uh, and, and learn on the job. And, and so long about April 1st, our decision was made, but not until then. For teams that need quarterbacks, there are a lot of them out there. How difficult is that process to figure out which of these guys can go from college football have everything it takes that you are looking for in that athlete and then transform their game from Saturdays to Sundays and to lead franchises. It's very more dif much more difficult today than it was when Peyton was coming out. Why? The spread offense. The spread offense in college, and, and it's now used in high school and junior high school all across America, is very different, totally different than the NFL. The quarterback never calls a play. It's called for him from the sideline. He never sets a protection. The quarterback in the NFL has to tell the offensive line where to block and who to block. 
and he has to recognize the defensive front. They never do that in the spread. In the spread, they're never under center. In the NFL, you're going to be under center probably 40% of the time. And, and, and some fans don't understand that that's a big deal. It's, it's a, a huge, huge deal. deal. It's a huge deal because you have to drop and you have to, used to, you have to be used to dropping with your back to the line of scrimmage. You have to make play action fakes. The running game is totally different in the NFL. In college football and in spread and in the option, they read one guy, the defensive end or the defensive tackle. In the NFL, you have to read the whole front and call, you may take the play and change it from the right side to the left and change it from an inside run to an outside run. You have to have the capacity to do that. And, um, and they don't do that at college football. So it's a huge, huge jump. So listen to me carefully. If you hear nothing more than this following sentence or sentences, do not expect the kids that come in this year who may be drafted in the first round to come in and play well. They will not. Take it to the bank. Be patient. They will not play well because they need time to learn everything you just laid out. That's correct. How then do you project if they can eventually get it? Well, you're looking for a couple of things. You're looking for athletic ability. You're looking for reasonable arm strength. The guy that can throw the furthest is meaningless. It's, 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 you're looking for accuracy. You're looking for the ability to process, which is huge, and that's measured by the various tests and then what you see with the guy when you get him in the room and put him on the chalkboard uh, and what you see on tape and the ability to play under pressure. You can only tell that from tape. You can tell it some from the psychological test, but tape is really the best indices of it. And then you put that all together, and you say, does this guy have the capacity to grow and get better and eventually be a starting quarterback and a winning quarterback in this league? And uh, many are called, but few are chosen. You're drafting human beings, not automatons. And, and there is no algorithm that I've ever come across that changes that. Is there a, if you were building your board today, would you have a first round grade on any of these quarterbacks in this draft? I would have a low first round grade. Um, I'd rather take them at the top of the second round. But teams can't do that. No, I, look, I always told our scouts and our coaches, let's don't manufacture players. Because we have a need at the position Let's don't manufacture a player. I would rather take a player who doesn't fill a need but is a really good player, Reggie Wayne, for example. How many people remember Reggie Wayne, the choice? Right? There was nobody applauding when we took Reggie Wayne <laughs> because all the newspaper guys and the media people said they don't need a receiver. They got Marvin Harrison. Why are they taking a receiver? You need two sometimes. Yeah. But take the best player. Don't manufacture players. Who's the best quarterback you've scouted not named Peyton Manning over the years? Jimmy Garoppolo. Why? Um, live arm, live feet, uh, a, a winner. Now, that's in recent years. Uh, Brady, obviously, when he came out, was pretty darn good. He had been beaten out, won his job back. By the time we got to the, his bowl game, he was playing the kind of football that he, that he, that he plays now. And... Uh, Flacco was, was, was darn good. A Big Ben. Big Ben would be the best other than Peyton. How about that guy with the, with the beard that plays here? Uh, he's right up there. He's right there. He's right there with Big Ben. Right there. Yeah. Take a walk down memory lane, if you could, the, the Super Bowl team here. What, what was that night like for you? You know, again, Indianapolis fans will recognize this. The more emotional game for us was the championship game because it was here in front of our fans. It was pure. We slew the dragon. <laughs> we were on our way to the Super Bowl. The dream, in a sense, had come true. We were one step away. It's funny you say that. I, I was in Dallas last weekend for, for the Cowboys' uh, 25th anniversary of their 92 team. And, and almost to a man, they say that, yes, beating the Bills 52, whatever it was, sorry, uh, was something. However, that beating San Francisco yeah. the week before at Candlestick, that when they walked into the tunnel and they walked into the locker room, that for them was everything. Yeah, that was the big rival. That, that was exactly like us, ourselves and the Patriots. Because it was getting there. We have time for fan questions, certainly. 
Hi, uh, have you had any thought about taking a GM job lately, or did you give any consideration in taking the Colts job? No, I did not give any consideration to taking the Colts <laughs> job, although I did ha give – Mr. Arce asked for my thoughts. And, and so I, 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 I gave him a, a, a lot of thoughts, and we talked a lot about w the direction of the franchise. And I'm very happy with the pick of Chris Ballard, and I endorse him wholeheartedly. He's a, I've gotten to know him. He's a smart guy. He, he's got his feet firmly planted on the ground. He knows what it takes to win. And he's had great training both with the Bears, where he was with Lovey, and, and with, in uh, uh, Kansas, Kansas City, so with Andy and John Dorsey. So I was happy about that. My wife is, is if I entertained any thoughts, she says no, and that's the end of it. How much do you miss it? I miss it. I always miss it. I miss it now. I miss it on draft day, you know. I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss it. Of course, of course. Next fan question. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Bill. I uh, completely agree on Jimmy Garoppolo, by the way. A huge fan as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you what you thought about uh, kind of how scouting has changed in the digital age, how now we have, other than just like an all-22 look, we have multi-angles, we have kids in high school uploading reels. It, it's completely changed. Just want to know your thoughts. Well, it, you know, it's changed technologically, but I, but I do think that... Um, it's still the same. What, what you're looking for are football players within certain parameters that you've set. The HD has made it a lot better, that's for sure. And tape made it a lot better. And the computer has made it a lot better because now I can pull up, uh, if I want to watch all the quarterbacks who worked out today, I can pull them up on the computer and I don't have to splice and do all the things that I did when I was a young scout. And I certainly don't have to carry that projector around. <laughs> but but uh, uh, it, so that's helped. But the job is still the same. It's still finding football players. There are new ways to look at players. Statistical analysis. You guys have been doing many of those things for years. What do you think of this trend now? Well, I think that you look at anything that's developed and you say to yourself, does this have practical application? For example... Uh, people now talk about the ability to measure catch radius, which is really wingspan. The NBA has been doing it for quite some time because of rebounding. Obviously, the longer your arms and the higher you can jump, the better rebounder you're going to be. Common sense. Height doesn't play into that as much as arm length and, and jump does. In football, um, I saw a, a study that a friend of mine had done um, where catch radius doesn't really all doesn't mean that much. There are not that many contested catches where radius makes a difference. So that's a, a statistic that I might pay attention to, but I wouldn't bet the ranch on. Hi, right, Bill. You obviously put together the best run ever here with the Indy, but looking back, do you have any regrets you would do different that you think would have won more than one Super Bowl with Peyton? Yeah, um, I, I wish we had... I wish and this is no knock on Anthony Costanzo. I think he's a great, he was a great pick and he's a good player. Um, I wish we'd taken, had taken Andy Dalton because of what happened afterwards. We didn't know Peyton was going to get hurt. We didn't know that Peyton was going to have that operation. We didn't know that he was going to miss the whole season. We had no knowledge of that when we drafted. And had we had knowledge of that, I'm certain we would have drafted Andy Dalton, and I think we probably would have finished somewhere in the 8-8, eight and eight, maybe 7-9 and nine area, and, because Andy was a rookie and would have struggled. But, A, we would have kept our jobs. I didn't care so much for myself. I'd had a great run, but there are a great many other people that, who didn't deserve to lose their jobs who did. That's just the nature of the turnover in the business. And, and then... I told Peyton when he signed his last contract, he said to me, how far do you think we are away? And I think I said this is at the start of the 11 preseason. I think we're two years away. I think we'll be back in two years. We can say to ourselves, we've been rebuilt. Um, our core guys are still here, but we've 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 built the depth it takes and the explosiveness to take that, that it takes um, to win a Super Bowl. And as it turned out, he went to the Super Bowl two years from then. In 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 uh, Denver. Denver, yeah. So uh, that's my regret, because I think had we stayed, um, 
we probably would have gone to one more Super Bowl, and you never know where you're going to win, but I, I'm pretty, I felt good about the ability to do it. Great. Hi, Bill. Big fan. Um, there's Thank a you. number of big uh, free agents, wide receivers uh, out there today. As a GM, when do you make the decision to move on from like a former first rounder in Philip Dorsett um, and, and decide to go after somebody in the free agency? And who do you think would fit the Colts offense best if we did? Well, I don't think that you, you, you make the decision to move on with a young player until you're, you're convinced that he has no future with you. Uh, the combination of the low salary for uh, incoming players now, which didn't exist when Peyton was here, um, and and you know your ability to want to grow them, they all they all need to grow in pro football. There's no bigger jump that a player takes than between his first and second years, because in his first year, he's never had any time off. He goes from college football to the combine, to the workouts, to the draft, to minicamp. He gets a about two weeks off because the strength and conditioning coaches want to get their hands on him. And then he comes back to training camp and plays 12 games. And at Thanksgiving, he's played the equivalent of a full college season. And if you want to see what rookies look like at Thanksgiving, walk into a facility, you can pick them out. They're pale. <laughs> they got the thousand yard stare. They're walking. <laughs> Whoa. You mean to tell me we got four more games left? Yeah. And maybe three more after that, we hope. <laughs> so when the season ends, they go home and sleep for a month and, 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 and then come back and begin to grow and get bigger and stronger and become men and not boys. So there is a, 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 a real growth period for young players. Um, so you want to let them go through that and develop. And, and then at the end of his contract, then you decide, are we going to keep him or not? To go in the free agent market is dangerous because you have to be really strong as a GM and this, well, that's part of it. Money is part of it, but two things happen with free agency that you never get back. Money and cap space and time because you're going to invest time in that player and if he doesn't perform, you've wasted that time and you've wasted that money. And a GM, the, the GM's toughest job is not the draft. It's free agency because you are being whipsawed by the fans and the press and the agents to sign names instead of players. One more. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Polian. Um, with today's 21st century and super fast-paced society, how much does the social media aspect play into it, especially <laughs> with the kids who take their camera phones out and snap videos before the players, potential players have any idea it's happening? Well, first of all, I'll tell you what I used to tell the players, and this is obviously amplified by what you just mentioned in the 21st century. This, this is really a, uh, an, an increasing and growing phenomenon. Um, I used to tell them, first of all, the minute, you sat, the minute you signed your contract, you gave away your privacy. When you become a professional athlete, you have bargained away your privacy. That's one of the prices you pay for the uh, tremendous amounts of money that you make. That's one thing. Second thing is that somebody is always watching. It doesn't matter who, when, where, how, someone's always watching. So you need to conduct yourself in a way that the camera is always on you. You can never presume that it isn't. You're now doing something in your life that you've never done before which is to play for something bigger than yourself. And in this day of, of, of tweets and social media and a sort of an I society, football and all sports, but football because it contains so many people and because it's the ultimate team game, represents, along with the military, the antithesis of the I society. It's the we society, we and us. And, and uh, rather than I and me. And so you have to buy into that when you sign your contract. That's what we expect of you. What does being a Colt mean to you? Uh, well, it means you stand for, for, for the right thing. No, but to uh, you personally. Personally? To, 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 uh, to have been here, to I, I can feel this love. It's very simple. Uh, and I, I, I read uh, in a book by General Eisenhower's, President Eisenhower's children, um, 
or grandchildren, rather, uh, that they asked him when he left the White House, um, what would you like to be called in your post-presidency, Mr. President or General? And he never hesitated. He said, General. And they were shocked. And they said, why? And he said, because I earned the title of general. And the reason I wear this ring, not that I'm anything like General Eisenhower, by any <laughs> means, or even, even, even close to General Custer, you know, <laughs> is the reason I wear this ring is because I earned it and I'm proud of it. And on that note, that's a, that's a round of applause from Colts fans right there. Bill Polian. Thank you so much for taking the time. Belated congratulations to the Pro Football Hall of Fame as well. Continued success on television. We'll see you down the line. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Go Polio, everybody.